All right, our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, is Dennis Kucinich, who's a former Democratic congressman from Ohio and two-time candidate for president. In 1977, he became Cleveland's youngest mayor at the age of 31. As a 2008 presidential candidate, Kucinich ran on a platform supporting single-payer health care, impeaching Vice President Dick Cheney, and the establishment of a Department of Peace. That would be nice. Last month, Kucinich announced plans to run for Congress as an independent in Ohio's 7th House District. Please welcome back to the show, Dennis Kucinich. Good to see you. Hey, <clears throat> Jimmy, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be on here and also to join with you and Steph and, and Kurt Metzger. Uh, hey. you got a great team there, and I'm glad to have a chance to communicate with it. I So tell me the, the theory behind you running as an independent. Now, I know that the... Was it the they? So you're the real deal. You really are a real lefty, and you care about uh, the workers and the people and honesty. And uh, they gerrymandered you out of your district. That was your reward for that. Did the Democrats do that to you, or was that that the Republicans? Oh, that was the Democrats. There's no question about it. And so you know, t today I'm in the center. What I stand for is in the center of American politics, and the district I'm running in. I represented 45% of it in previous Congresses. So they must, not been, they must not have paid attention when they did the latest mapping and put together a community of uh, people who I've uh, had a long standing association with. And so as an independent, I'm able to reach out to the broadest constituency. I've had a reputation for working across the aisle. And at this point, uh, Jimmy, and I think this is the, it's gonna come down to this. You're going to have a closely divided Congress. And so if I'm able to be elected as an independent, I have a pretty good chance to do that. I'm going to be in a pivotal role in the next Congress with the, the D's and R's being closely uh, balanced or depends on one's editorial position on that. But I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to that opportunity. So wh why not run as a Democrat? Well, you, you know, this, this district... First of all, I'm very concerned about the Democratic Party having, you know, the official Democratic Party having gone in the direction of war. You have to remember, I led the effort in, um, in 2001, 2002, 2003, trying to avert a war as a result of 9-11. And I pointed out early on that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, with Al-Qaeda's role in 9-11. Iraq didn't have the ability to attack the United States, uh, that this whole, the whole effort to create a war against Iraq was based on, on lies. And, and I gave about 351 speeches in the House of Representatives during the time that I was in Congress, pointing out the urgency of either avoiding the war or getting out of it, stopping the slaughter. You know, we had as many as 5,000 uh, U.S. Uh, men and women who lost their lives, tens of thousands injured, and notably also about a million Iraqis who were killed, uh, as, uh, who was lo lost their lives as a result of the war. So, you know, my party since that time has increasingly uh, gone in the direction of supporting wars. And I can't. I, I see something different. I see these regime change wars are wrecking our country. They're ruining our economy. They're ruining the, the uh, people in terms of adding to the personal debt of the country, the, private, uh, the public debt of the country. And we're, our country's in trouble because of these endless wars. We're, we're, we're ransoming our country for, for war and debt. And I'm, my candidacy and my presence in the Congress will uh, finally create that space in the American political dialogue to, to say, look, uh, we have to change our direction or we're going to lose it all here. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're running as an independent. It makes it very easy for me to get behind you and to, to, to endorse your candidacy. Uh, no problem. Great. You don't think you could do more good from the inside? <laughs> 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 so yeah, well, the, go ahead. the problem is that people... Uh, like uh, people who share our views of how things should run, people who are anti-war, uh, people who are pro-worker. Far-right people, basically. <laughs> uh, are now being called far-right uh, maniacs, and they don't ask for the Democratic Party 
anything for their vote, right? This because they've created this boogeyman called Donald Trump and MAGA. Now, anything Joe Biden and the Democrats do, you just have to go along with it because you don't want Trump, do you? And so African-Americans have stopped doing that. They You can't scare them. 22% of African-Americans say they're going to vote for Donald Trump, right? So that's the guy they've called a white supremacist for the last eight years. And here is uh, Killer Mike. Uh, he was on with Bill Maher uh, just the other day. And watch how what, what he's going to do here is called Politics 101. And it blows Bill Maher's mind. Bill Maher cannot wrap his mind around the idea that a black guy just won't reflexively endorse Joe Biden and say he's going to vote for Joe Biden. Let's watch this and I'll get your reaction to it. It's about a minute and a half. What are your feelings on the election coming up? I mean, Biden and Trump... Are you as depressed about that as most people, my, as a choice? My, my feeling is pick your policy, not your person. Find out. <laughs> this, is, this is not the Dallas Cowboys versus your favorite team. This is, this is the policies that will affect our generations for the next 20, 30, 40 years to come. So close your eyes, listen to the policies that are being pushed, and... and Pay attention even to the people who don't have a chance of winning because they're going to say policies you may want to push. And I would say do that, but make it policy based. Make so, it policy. so that means, therefore, that means I'm, I'm for black people and happy black history. But you're not, you're not saying one candidate over the other? Hey, man, my nigga, you ain't going to get me in no trouble tonight. <laughs> 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 hey, my, 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 no, no, my, that's your job with me, to my, get me in trouble. My grandfather gave me some stellar advice sometimes. He said, son, sometimes well, you just got to know to stay out of white folks' business. And well, <laughs> well, this, this, this time, I'm going to keep my mouth closed. I, I still like the policy that the old man had that I was supporting. I would encourage people to find who's supporting that policy and, and see what But happens. you can't get yourself to say vote for Biden over Trump? You you want me to list it now? So now now I'm, we I'm gotta, just saying that can, that's, can he get himself to apologize? He just for told the, you he couldn't. He, he's so so all all Bill Maher can get through his head is Trump, but Trump. All I have to know is Trump, and then I vote for it. reflexively. I have to endorse genocide in Gaza. I have to endorse war in Ukraine. I have to endorse crushing a railroad use you know, worker strike. I have to endorse vetoing Medicare for all for everybody. Just because Trump, 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 and he's got a great response. Here's his response, Brian Bill. Can he get can he get himself oh. to get his head out of his ass and say, black people, you you are black regardless. I need you to tell me what I need to do. <laughs> can he pick a coalition of former people who are affected by drug laws, street gangs, recidivism and crime and say, I need you as a board to advise me how to fix federal prisons? If he can do that, absolutely I can. So my challenge is out. So what that's called is politics 101. That's Killer Mike asking for something for his vote. I'm not going to. I give you my vote until you promise me something, until you show me you're going to do something for me and my community. That all went out the window with uh, with Bernie Sanders in 2016, who demanded absolutely nothing for himself to get behind Hillary Clinton and the establishment. And he did the exact same thing in 2020. He asked nothing of the establishment or Joe Biden to for his endorsement, personal or for the support of his coalition that he had built. And guess what he got? And, and because of that, nothing. They didn't get a minimum wage. They didn't get help for workers during COVID. They got two more wars. They're saber rattling with China. They got didn't get in front. They got nothing. They got a anyway. Uh, so also the guy's senile. He's not too old. The, yeah, he's senile. He's not, too, he's not too old. He has dementia, and that could happen at a at a young age. I know people in their fifties that have dementia. It's got nothing to do with his age. It has everything to do with his mental state. But anyway, Dennis, what do you say to that? Why that when people stopped asking for something for their vote, which is all I've been preaching at this show since 2016. Don't commit when a pollster calls you and asks you who you're voting. Don't commit until they come and get your vote. Come get my vote. I told Hillary her. Clinton. I Yeah, <laughs> instead of her being with me, they wanted me to be with her. I told Hillary Clinton, come get my vote. I told Joe Biden, come get my vote. And they didn't. What do you say to what Mike uh, Killer Mike just said? Well, <clears throat> Killer Mike's uh, voice is rising from the street. And when I heard him, uh, you know, this is a song from another generation, uh, but I, the words of a Simon and Garfunkel song came into my head called Sounds of Silence. The words of the prophet are written on subway walls, tenement halls. Uh, there's a prophecy coming from the streets. 
And when you and what I'm focusing on in this race is the fact that we're getting war instead of housing, war instead of education, war instead of child care, war instead of retirement security, on and on and on. This this thirty four trillion dollar debt that we have, about eight trillion dollars is attributable to the uh, fairly recent wars. If you look at the Watson Institute at Brown University and what you know, we're ransoming our future for these wars and the American people are just being led down a, uh, a bloody path. So should people be asking for something for their vote? Absolutely. Now, to be clear, Jimmy, you know, I'm running as an independent. I am not aligned with any presidential campaign. I will not make an endorsement in the presidential election. I'm running in a district that's 47 percent independent. So, you know, people are going to look for leadership for me for the Congress. You know, some of my friends are for are for Trump. Some of my friends are for Biden. Some of my friends are for Kennedy. Me, I'm for my friends. So you you brought up war and I know you've always been a staunch anti-war advocate. Uh, that's why you're unpopular. That's why the Democrats didn't like you. That's a big reason why they gerrymandered you out of your own district. You can keep Dennis up, please. And um, uh, so I was watching uh, Morning Joe the other day. I actually wasn't. I, I can't. I, <laughs> <laughs> I used to watch. I would wake. I would stay up extra late use, when I started the show. And I would watch Morning Joe before I went to sleep because it came on at like three in the morning. Uh -huh. And people go, why do you do that? I go, because I like to go to bed angry. <laughs> and uh, so here is Chuck Schumer. Chucky the Schum is on. Yeah. And he's got a big... Uh, he he's he's got a big bill he's trying to push through a hundred and eighteen billion dollars a hundred and eighteen billion dollars. I always say, wouldn't it be great if Chuck Schumer came up with a bill for one hundred and eighteen billion dollars that he wanted to spend on America? Wouldn't that be amazing? But here he wants to again he wants to spend it on foreign wars. He wants to spend it on Ukraine and he wants to spend it on Israel. So let's listen to what he has to say. We're at a turning point in America. This bill is crucial and history will look back on it and say, did America fail itself? Why is it crucial? D uh, did America fail itself? <laughs> is that the question? Yes, Chuck. Every day for the last 50 years, America has failed itself. This isn't so much a turning point as Wiley Coyote looking down after he walks off a cliff. That's what this is. And OK, here we go. Well, if we don't aid uh, Ukraine, Putin will be walk all over Ukraine. We will lose the war immediately. Immediately, he's on to he's on to you, and he's on to Ukraine. This is the turning point for America. Blah blah blah. Does Chuck all think we all have a crackhead son who works for Burisma? Is that what this is about? That's weird. I, he said, if we don't stand up right now. For, for Ukraine, that Russia's going to walk all over Europe. Listen. We could be fighting in Eastern Europe in a NATO ally in a few years. Americans won't like that. Wait a minute. I thought that was the point of, so if... What about the jobs? We love I, jobs. I, first of all, <laughs> not, never about jobs, but it's always about war. And he says that if we don't send another $100 billion to Ukraine to fight this proxy war, which is an economic war with Russia, has nothing to do with saving the uh, sovereignty of Ukraine. They could have had that. They had peace agreements. The two Minsk Accords had that. They could have did that. They don't want that. They actually wanted this, which is, and they also wanted to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline, which the United States did because they want to sell more natural gas to Europe, even though Europe, uh, Germany is now spending four times the amount for their energy than they were before they blew that up. But my 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 point is, he said that if we don't stop them, it's that whole thing. If we don't stop them there, we're going to have to stop them over here. Well, now they're saying if we don't stop them in Ukraine, we're going to have to stop them in other parts of Europe. Isn't that what NATO's for? Isn't that what NATO? That's that why NATO, we have NATO. So if he attacks a NATO country, NATO comes to as a deterrent, <laughs> not the United <laughs> States constantly. That's where I, I thought we had a deterrent. I thought the deterrent was called NATO. And anyway, so here, let's play the rest and then I'll bring Dennis in. If we don't help Israel defend itself against Hamas, that perpetual war will go on and on and on. If we don't help humanitarian aid to the starving Palestinians in Gaza, hundreds of thousands could starve. And the border, everyone has said it's chaos. A speaker, you just saw Speaker Johnson, he said it's mm -hmm. chaos. We have to do something legislative a few months ago. But what has happened, in answer your, to que your question, so this is crucial for America. It's a turning point. History is going to look over our shoulders and say, did we rise to the occasion? 
to his credit, Mitch McConnell did. Oh, but God. too many Republicans, yeah. including Speaker Johnson, are just scared to death of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has said he wants chaos. Donald Trump has said, well, wait till I become president. That'll take at least a year. Ukraine could be gone. The border will get much Jesus worse. Christ. War in the Middle East will get worse, maybe bring, bringing, bringing us into it. He's doing it all for political reasons. And let me just say, will senators, the crucial question, the $64,000 question, the majority of Republican senators know this bill is the right thing to do. It's a compromise. I don't like everything in it. Neither does McConnell. What? But it's a compromise. That's the only way you get things important done in the Senate. We proved that two years ago in our bipartisan legislation. And will the senators drown out the political noise from Trump and his minions Voters? And do the right thing for America. <laughs> it's a crucial question. History will, is looking down on every one of us right now. Is history like Jesus or something? I, I don't know, but isn't that weird? Because the last time we had an emergency, they just locked everybody down without any legislation. And they didn't tie it to Ukraine or Israel. They just got those lockdowns done quick. But yeah. it, it's weird. He's saying you have to drown out the noise of Trump and his supporters. His supporters are half the country. So he's saying you have to drown out the noise of American voters. Dennis, what do you say to this kind of crazy warmongering? Well, uh, you know, without uh, addressing... My friend Chuck Schumer directly. I served with him in the House, but you know we're certainly on opposite sides on this one. Wait, Dennis, would you say we gave the wrong Schumer a comedy show after seeing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, so I'm listening. I'm listening to uh, that segment, and I remember my friend Gore Vidal, who wrote a book called "Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace." So we're we're set on a, a path here for perpetual war. Now, what happened in Ukraine is we've sacrificed. Uh, the flower of Ukrainian youth, we, you know, Russians sacrificed their uh, young people in a, in a war that was essentially about energy markets. Uh, as a result, the price of energy went through the roof in Europe. Uh, the, the, it, the, it, there was a destruction of an energy market, the blowing up of the pipeline. We, you know, we have a pretty good idea who did that. Uh, but in terms of the policies here, what for America, and that's what I, I'm concerned about. I, I am not concerned about any of these other countries when it comes to what are our priorities. Our obligation is to take care of America first, first and foremost. Everything else gets set aside. But what we've done is we have empowered a coalition, an economic coalition involving uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And as a result, uh, we have created a block, an economic block, that will threaten uh, U.S.'s uh, hegemony, certainly. It'll threaten the dollar because uh, th there's more uh, money trades going on now in uh, yuan or in rubles. Uh, the U.S., this, this policy of constant war is undermining the American economy. The elasticity that the dollar has provided for the American economy's growth is being shelved. We're being we're being destroyed by these constant wars, and they were totally unnecessary. Jimmy, you started to talk about it. Uh, I think it was in March of 2022. There was a deal on the table that would have uh, given Ukraine uh, a, a tremendous amount of leverage and freedom. That deal was was nixed with the help of Boris Johnson, and uh, when a, a peace agreement of some kind or another, a settlement is finally achieved, Ukraine will end up with less than they could have gotten a few years ago. In the meantime, you have all these dead, dead people on both sides. And who benefits? Well, the war contractors benefit. That's right. And the, and, the, and the fossil fuel companies benefit, who are now selling liquefied natural gas to Europe at four times that at least double the price that they were getting before when they were getting it through the Nord Stream pipeline. So the same people, uh, it's the same story. It's just a new package, right? And uh, because of Russiagate and that complete hoax that we've debunked since day one on this show, we were the first ones in the entire country to debunk Russiagate because I brought on Bill, Will, uh, Bill Binney, from the NSA code breaker. He was a top code breaker for decades. And he told me there was no way 
that uh, Russia tapped into the DNC server, and he, he proved it to us forensically. And ever since that, they and I said, everybody at the Young Turks, they're going to use Russiagate and our hatred for Putin to start a war. And here it is. They've always wanted to go to war uh, with Russia. They thought it would hurt them economically. Then what we actually ended up doing was pushing Russia closer to China, which everybody from Henry Kissinger to Noam Chomsky said, you shouldn't do that. And they said that for decades. And here we are doing that very thing. The very thing that the establishment told me Donald Trump was going to do, which was wreck our reputation with the world, make everybody, our enemies stronger, and now is happening under Joe Biden and the neocons he's in bed with. Now we are having power centers developed called BRICS, right? So now there's economic power centers that are there to oppose the United States hegemony, and once the United States dollar is no longer the reserve currency, that's going to take right. our tank our economy. Right now, Saudi people don't know about this because they don't want you to know about this, but our dollar, ever since we went off the gold standard is propped up by the petrodollar, which means Saudi Arabia has agreed not to sell oil in any other currency except the U.S. dollar. Well, because of our war in uh, Ukraine and this meddling we've been doing all over the world, uh, Saudi Arabia has started selling oil in other currencies, which is bad for the United States. Nobody will tell you that except this show here. So all the things that they say that Donald Trump is going to do, Joe Biden said Donald Trump is going to start a war with Iran. Donald, And now he's starting a war with Iran. So um, let Wait, me just... But what if Russia attacks Europe with cheap natural gas? <laughs> like doing. But, but, you know, hold on a minute. Go I just ahead. Wanna, you know, one of the things that I'm talking about back home here uh, to, to people... Uh, in, in the uh, 7th Congressional District, where I'm running as an independent, is that you go back to 9-11, and since 9-11, uh, the average family of four ha has, it's, this regime change wars, it's cost that family about $100,000. Think about that. Got to you know, spend money take, to make money. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Right. But, but you think about that, you have, uh, uh, you know, I think it was Brown, again, uh, the Watson Institute maybe may have discussed this. Uh, you've got about $8.2 trillion in the debt that's attributable to the wars. You divide that by, you know, four families of four, 83.7 million, you get about $100,000 per family of four. Wars creating poverty in this country. We're not taking care of our own people, and we're all over the world telling people how to live, but our job as a nation should be to take care of our own people. And we sure aren't doing that because, look at child poverty is up, uh, you, you have a life expectancy down, uh, it's harder for people to get a home, uh, you know, overdose deaths are through the roof. What are we doing about America? And, and this is where uh, our people in government are losing sight of what our purpose is. It's to take care of America first and foremost, not be running all over the world telling people how to live. You know, we know we've all had neighbors I don't have those neighbors now, but we've all had neighbors in our life who want to constantly put their nose in our business and they end up not being the best neighbors. So I also want to ask you about. Um, here's Chuck Schumer giving a speech, pledging his loyalty to basically another country. And the problem, uh, that's a big problem. Uh, the the APEC lobby, the Israeli lobby. And here he is uh, genuflecting to them. For as long as I live, for as long as I have the privilege of serving in the Senate from New York, I will unflinchingly, unstintingly, and with all of my strength, be Shomer Yisrael, a guardian of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yisrael Chai. In Israel and America, the Jewish nation lives now and forever. So he says, uh, with Israel and America, the Jewish nation lives. Once again, another glaring slip of the tongue. He just pointed out who owns him once more. They rely on Americans not really listening or paying attention, like when the TV ads for pharma pharmaceuticals have all those horribly uh, side effects that they list at, at under in a soft breath and a muted tone so nobody knows what's going on. That's why so many people have anal leakage now. They weren't really paying attention. So what do you say about people like Chuck Schumer, who no matter what Israel does, no matter the genocide they're committing, uh, he's going to support them. Would you, would you support uh, this uh, Israeli campaign in Gaza today if you were in Congress? No, I don't. I, I would not, and I don't. Um, our first obligation is to the United States of America. And, you know, I'm, look, 
I, I want to see Israel continue to exist as a country. And frankly, the guidance that the United States is providing for Israel may be counterproductive to that. When you look at, at the arms that are being provided with the money that has been provided uh, and the destruction that is going on in Gaza and the, uh, and, and the killings in the West Bank, uh, the entire Arab world is literally up in arms over this. It's not sitting back. Uh, and Israel, can, it, as a nation, could be at risk. And uh, there's people who are in the Jewish community who are painfully aware of that. And so, uh, again, Jimmy, as a, as a member of Congress, I feel very strongly that our first obligation is to uh, America and beyond that, um, if we really want, uh, Israel, you know, Israel is a friend to many people in the Congress, I got that, but <laughs> we cannot let our friends be accomplices to murder. We cannot let our friends be accomplices to genocide. We have to uh, guide them. You know, if our brothers and sisters are killing each other and that's what's happening, it's for us to help them reconcile so the killing stops. Unfortunately, that's not our approach in the Middle East. These wars continue, the potential for it to go from uh, local to regional to international is there. And my voice in the Congress as an independent will be to point out the folly of these wars. Uh, I don't have, you know, and, and the danger of us losing sight of what the purpose is of the United States of America for our own people. Uh, Dennis, let, 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 let me just, before I bring you, I just want to remind people we're here with Dennis Kucinich. He is running as an independent in Ohio's 7th District for the House of Representatives. Russ Dobular has a question for you. Go ahead, Russ. Uh, listening to Chuck Schumer there talking about both funding Israel and funding relief efforts, <laughs> uh, it reminded me of the line in Apocalypse Now where Willard says, it's a way we had over here of living with ourselves. We cut him in half with a machine gun and give him a Band-Aid. It was a lie. Isn't the best way to help the Palestinians to cut off funding to Israel? Well, I think the best way to help the Palestinians right now, ceasefire, end the war, uh, find a way to help the Palestinians have their own state or states, make it possible to uh, for people to survive. Stop sending money over to kill more people. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're in a place right now, I, I just want to go back to what I said, we keep on, all these, all these wars are on a credit card. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, but Jimmy, you know, a moment ago, you talked about Russia uh, and China. So uh, do we really have the capacity to be in a war with Russia, a war with China, a war in the Middle East. Uh, is somebody thinking about how does this serve the maintenance of our United States of America? Again, we're losing our way. We should be paying attention to our concerns here at home, which ought to be housing and, and health care and wages and, uh, that, and then we should Then we security. should cut off funding to Israel, right? Can't taper off a of Ponzi scheme, I don't, Russell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, stop the war, period. And, you know, I, and not just Israel. But we need to look at all foreign military aid across the board. We need to we need to start we need to start to pull back these 800 bases that we have around the world, which are are running up uh, the deficit. You know, I think it was Michael Hudson who wrote about uh, back in 1972. He looked at Vietnam and he said that much of the trade deficit at that time was attributable attributable to the Vietnam War. So when you think about the consequences, you know, the bottom line is who's going to pay for this? And the American people who are back home worried about if they can afford their mortgage, if they can afford their rent, because right now it's increasingly difficult for people to be able to buy homes. Uh, you know, the cost, the median cost, I think it was David Stockman recently reported that uh, in the last uh, decade, the uh, median cost for uh, a house has gone up uh, uh, in terms of a, a people's budget has gone up from 21 to 41 percent of of a of a family budget. I mean, how are people going to survive? This whole idea of empire, of world hegemony, is is lunacy. It is a fantasy. 
that we have to disabuse ourselves of and start focusing on what the needs are of the American people first and foremost. I find it shocking that they don't, uh, that they that the, their biggest plea is for, for, for war. It's like, you've got to fund this war. You've got to fund that war. We need more. And so you would be for closing down some of those 800 military bases that the United States has around the world, yes? Uh, yes, and let's go further. You look at these at, at Russia, you look at China. China in particular has focused on the economic growth of the country. And I voted against China trade. I thought it was a rotten deal for the U.S. And these big multinational corporations, you know, went into Gucci Gulch and uh, outside the ca- outside the Capitol with thousands of lobbyists. And they basically bought off the Congress. And we ended up with a China trade deal for most favored nation that added to the economic stress in our own country. And it was all to help lower wages here and drive up profits to the big multinationals. Now, look, I understand how this system works. And that's why to go back to Congress as an independent, I can be a voice for reason and sanity, for economic integrity, and for taking care of things at home first. Not having bases all over the world. But, you know, it'd be nice to have, uh, to, instead of building bases, to build schools, for example. What a thought. Uh, and, and instead of building jails, also build schools, right? And community centers. Right. Or at least sure. make the jails a little roomier since they're <laughs> double the size, <laughs> double the populations intended, all of them. So uh, you, let me ask you, you what, what would be uh, your solution right now? So people, it seems really crazy what's happening with our border, right? Um, everybody knows that you have to have some kind of an orderly immigration policy and my theory here at this show, what I've said was... Wages were too high? I was... Uh, yeah, wages are way too... So it's a tight labor, labor market. And what Bernie used to say, just as recent as 2016, uh, was that it's a Koch brothers uh, policy to have open borders that flood our country with low-wage workers to suppress wages. And right now it's a tight labor market. It's like 3.4% unemployment percent unemployment. And so that's one big reason why they're doing it. Also, they can't meet their military recruiting numbers anymore, as Dick Durbin admitted in the Senate. And so that's why he's pushing for a bill to, to allow uh, illegal immigrants to join our military and then immediately give them uh, citizenship. And so... It's a ne- very nefarious game that they won't fix homelessness. Why? Let me let's start there. Dennis, why do you think the establishment won't fix homelessness? And do you have a plan to address it? The homelessness is, is a great American scourge. I mean, I'm here in Cleveland, Ohio, where people are are begging for food and for money to buy food at freeway exits where people are s- sleeping on, on uh, street grates where heat's coming up in order to avoid freezing while they're outside in the winter. Homelessness is is a disgrace. And, you know, granted, there are mental health implications, but not anymore. I mean, you have families that don't have a place to live. Now, when I was growing up in Cleveland, there was a time when my family lived in a car. Just so your, your audience knows this, they may not realize it, where I come from. By the time I was 17, my family lived in 21 different places, including a couple cars. We were a big family, couldn't find rent, okay? That was 60 years ago and more. Today, there's, it's much more of a problem in this country. People don't have shelter. It's an obligation of a country to provide shelter. And it's an obligation to provide jobs. And it's an obligation to keep wages up. And it's an obligation to be able to uh, make service in the military honorable so the people who live in this country understand uh, that you can defend your country in many ways but not necessarily the only way by going to war. You can't, that only if America is really threatened. And right now, we're threatened from within. The, the, the outside threat is nothing compared to the inside threat. And so I'm, I'm um, uh, t- you know, I, I want to go back to the border issue, Jimmy, because, you, you, you know, this discussion raises it. My position, some people may think it's heartless, seal the border. You don't have a, you don't have a country if you don't have borders. You know, people can't people can't get into Canada, just walk over. It's not going to happen. You know, you can't get over there in a boat or a plane. Uh, you're not going to walk across the bridge uh, from, you know, to Ontario or from Niagara Falls. The, the immigration should be regularized. Uh, and we have gotten away from that. 
And as a result, it's not just that the uh, a plan to drive down wages, which Sanders, Bernie Sanders pointed out, and perhaps a plan to get more people in the military, but it's also we've opened the door, the borders for mules and drug cartels and anybody that wants to assault uh, American cities with their uh, illicit economic activity. And, and frankly, uh, this whole thing about the border is a nightmare. And the fact that the Biden administration has let it continue to me is reprehensible. What do you say? I've had people say when, when I make the case that, you know, I've heard you just say it. If you don't have a border, you don't have a country. But it's obvious that the billionaire class wants to have this open border for whatever reason. And people is your country now. And people tell me that, well, Joe Biden's spending more on border security than <laughs> than Donald Trump did. And I'm like, well, he's spending more on Ukraine security, too. That doesn't mean that's what that money's going <laughs> for. Right. He's that money is that's so worse than if he didn't spend yeah, anything. So he's not. Spe yeah. So again, so what do you say to that? Have an, have an audit. <laughs> yeah, let's have it <laughs> and find out where that money's going, yeah, right? Really, exactly. Okay, fant all right, that's great. And so, what would what would you say uh, would be the the your, your top issues that you are running on? Uh, when you, again, Dennis Kucinich running for Ohio seventh house district as an independent, God bless him. What would be your biggest uh, issues? Say top three issues. Well, restore the American economy. And that goes in with uh, stopping these endless wars, uh, start taking care of things back here at home in terms of, of, uh, of wages, housing, make housing more accessible and affordable. Certainly border security is a big issue uh, back home because people are concerned, wait a minute, somebody come into the country and they can get seemingly get benefits that people who live in this country all their life can't get. And there's a resentment that's building up against any kind of immigration and you know legal immigration is one thing but but sanctioning illegal immigration is 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 wrong so i'm looking at, at at a range of issues that all go back to economics jimmy that all go back to looking at how we establish our priorities and our priorities are totally out of whack uh they're they're they we should be looking at at how we strengthen the dollar not not policies that weaken it we should be looking at our energy policies in terms of of realistic, realistically uh, making sure that we have proper diplomacy that enables us to simultaneously avoid the wars and keep the price down. And we need to look at uh, at what we might do collectively as a country to start to uh, to deal with these high levels of atmospheric carbon, which are still a problem. There's no question about it. You know, it involves a much larger, uh, wider discussion. But, you know, just for my own part, because I remember, you know, at the beginning of the show, somebody came in and asked what I what, what is my position on the environment? I've been a vegan for 29 years. That's a personal choice I made. I, I drive a, a car. I, I live in a house that the same house for 53 years, 1208 square feet in a, in a working class neighborhood. In, in Cleveland, uh, we drive a high. I drive a hybrid. I just traded in my 2009 because the battery died uh, to uh, for a 2022 hybrid that gets you know 30, 36, 37 miles to a gallon. Uh, you know, it's, what kind of jet do you have though? <laughs> <laughs> or your wife's I, uh, jet <laughs> maybe it's your wife's Dennis jet did, who Dennis knows? didn't show up to the nancy pelosi school of insider trading when he was in congress no no he didn't no, no but I, and and we need to look at stock buybacks too okay <laughs> you know i look we each make our own commitment uh and don't forget war you want to talk about what contributes to atmospheric carbon levels how about war? War's got to be one of the largest contributors. All unnecessary, you know. Each each bomb that blows up, in addition to being a curse on Americans' uh, budget, uh, is contributing to to more war. And Jimmy, you know, there are people who are still hot for a nuclear confrontation. Okay, I gave a speech on the floor of Congress uh, years ago where I was talking about, hey, uh, you want to drop a uh, a nuclear weapon on Iran? Have you thought about? The radioactive pollution that's going to go around the world and comes home, you know. I, you know, my approach uh, uh, is based on common sense, 
It's reality based. It's based on where I come from. It's based on addressing the needs of people and taking care of things here at home. And so that's a message that this campaign is carrying forward. If people are interested in helping in any way, go to Kucinich.com. You'll see my announcement speech, which uh, will, you know, cover some of the things we just talked about, Jimmy. But I'm, uh, you know, I, I, you know, America's always had a crossroads, but right now we're in trouble. And I think most people realize that. I, I don't, no matter what generation you're a part of, you realize the country's in trouble and we've got to start focusing on things here and quit. It's always easy to, to deflect attention and look at something in another place and say, well, we'll take care of that. No, no. America. Right. Uh, I, it's, it's always amazing to me. We can't get health care, uh, living wages, uh, education, uh, infrastructure to our own country. But somehow we're going to be able to accomplish that in everybody else's country. It's the craziest thing. And so um, what do you say? So I've, I just saw an, I see news report after news. I just saw another news report. I mean, you've touched on this uh, in Boston. Uh, they are now using a community center. Uh, to house illegal immigrants. Uh, and now the local residents, and this is in an African-American community, and they're outraged over this, that they're not allowed to use their own community center. They've become white supremacists? It, they've, so that's, <laughs> so let me, let's put it in a bigger, let's put it in a bigger uh, context. So I don't know if you've seen the studies done, but after Occupy Wall Street, now let's remind people what Occupy Wall Street was. There was a response to the Bill Clinton deregulating Wall Street because he was a puppet and no, of the military industrial complex and Wall Street, and he was no friend of the working man. So he he took away all the regulations that kept Wall Street from screwing and crashing. Within 10 years after we repealed Glass-Steagall, it crashed and it hurt most. Who did it hurt? It hurt working people. And so people from the left, right and center came together at Occupy Wall Street to uh, protest the way they handled that. Right. Which way they handled that was Barack Obama bailed out the banks and he made sure they didn't miss their bonuses, the bankers. And he kicked five point one million families out of their houses. So when people saw the game that was being played, it was it was Democrats and Republicans coming together to serve corporations and screw regular Americans. They did occupy Wall Street. And so the establishment then had to realize we have to figure out how to divide and conquer these people again, because when they come together, that's the only thing that scares people. And that's why I'm glad you're running as a independent the only thing that scares the establishment is when people from the left and the right come together to oppose them but what they've been doing ever since then is trying to get us to turn on each other and if you look at the studies the the uh, uh mentions of white supremacy and racism uh have skyrocketed in the media the corporate owned media there's only six companies run by billionaires and my theory is that is there to divide us to keep us thinking that our problem is our as our neighbor instead of the problem is the oligarchy that has been doing this controlled demolition of our economy that is crushing everybody they don't want us to realize that and come together and oppose them so that's they're using white our fear of white supremacy and racism against us not that racism doesn't exist in america and it isn't a problem but they're oh they they are uh, using it and focusing on that as a way to divide us do you do you share that concern well, look, I, I've lived in integrated neighborhoods my whole life. The house that I live in in Cleveland uh, is in an integrated neighborhood. And, you know, to me, you know, to me, I see the world as one. I see the world as interdependent and interconnected, that we're, that we're all brothers and sisters. The human genome theory says we're 99.9% .9 made of the same stuff. And, you know, race, color, creed are... Our, our, fra our, our <clears throat> fractions of light that come through a prism of human unity. So this idea of racism in our society is abhorrent and trying to turn people in Massachusetts and other places into white supremacy because they want to use a community center. <laughs> is, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's just, it's, it, what it does though, seal the border. Don't bring more people in uh, across that border. And and people who are already here, look, we don't want it's it's bad enough that people are starving in the streets who were born in this country. But we have to do something to make sure that people aren't hungry. And we also have to, in some cases, we're going to have to give people a chance to go back to the country of origin and and to deal diplomatically with the conditions 
in those countries that cause people to want to leave. There's a lot of desperation out there. And, and America, you know, we can be a beacon, but we first have to be a beacon to our, to our, our own self as a nation. Right. And we can't, we can't pretend that we just open the borders everywhere. And I, I'm, I'm uh, very concerned about the political games that are being played to pit people. You said it, Jimmy, to pit people against each other. It's by design. Now, our campaign, you know, this is our logo right here. It's American Eagle, and we have in, in the Congress above the canopy of the House, there's an American Eagle, and I would point to it often and tell my colleagues that American Eagle needs two wings to fly. It, you know, it also needs a heart and a brain. So I hope to be able to bring some of those attributes uh, back to Congress. Well, I really appreciate your candor and uh, your unflinching support of peace and, uh, and sanity and uh, the working class and uh you know you, we we uh, it's that old saying physician heal thyself if we can't take care of our own people if we have hundreds of thousands of people and children homeless in america that we are not addressing and fixing we cannot be having an open border bringing in even more desperate people and i'm not Absolutely. that it's not to demonize people who want to come here or the immigrants at all it's not their fault they're they're the victim of our of foreign policy just as much our drug 100%. our drug war so but at the the same time uh letting them come in to cities that can't take care of our uh, their own people uh is not a solution all that does is create tensions it creates uh, uh, uh anti-immigrant sentiment and it that uh, nothing good's going to happen from that and you you're on that 100 percent lock down all of us but not the border they could lock down everybody in the country <laughs> How is that possible for two years straight but they couldn't well, lock down well, the border well, you know you know it raises it raises a question about you know, what government isn't doing right in this country, like surveillance. Yeah. Now, remember, I, I voted against the Patriot Act because I read it. I don't like the surveillance society. I want to see ways in which we can give return people's freedom. Again, it's about freedom in this country, not to create, quote, freedom in other places because we deliver bombs and we, you know, have an American flag on the uh, on the uh, warhead. No, <laughs> we have to change our direction. And that's something that I'm about. That's something this campaign as an independence about. And, you know, I again, Jimmy, I could very well end up being the, the only independent elected to the House in 2024 in a pivotal position, which I will use to help uh, workers, to help rebuild the middle class, to help save small businesses and to get us out of these endless wars. So something that's near and dear to my heart is free speech and anti-censorship. And we were all censored during COVID, unbelievably, at the behest of Big Pharma and the liars. Uh, where do you stand on that? Uh, look, uh, you know, this, this idea of these big tech companies basically purloining the First Amendment and squatting on it and saying uh, free speech for, for, uh, for me, but not for thee. Uh, I have a, you know, yeah. I mean, the idea of centering people, free speech is the card is the cornerstone of this country, and the minute that we let it be eroded in any way, we put ourselves at the mercy at this place and in a, at this time an econotechnic system that is adverse to human values. And so, yeah, I mean, I have, you know, my feeling: stand for free speech, speak freely. You know, that's what I did in Congress. I gave hundreds of speeches uh, over the years, most of them trying to keep us out of wars or get out of wars. But the, the basic cornerstone of our country has to be uh, free speech. And, you know, freedom of the press, uh, A.G. Liebline famously said, it belongs to the person who owns one. The fact that there's been a contraction in media ownership is a major problem at every level. And, you know, it's not just print, but, it, but it's, the, it's the Internet. It's the uh, uh, television stations, this, you know, which, of course, their market share is is sinking. Uh, the whole media landscape has changed, but the cornerstone has to be free speech. And and and, and Julie, what, she, where do you stand on Julian Assange? Oh, he, look, he ought to be released. He's he is a he is a prime example. Julian Assange is a prime example of what happens when the military industrial complex wants to crush someone who's exposing actually what is going on. Now, 
reporters for conventional media uh, would get a Pulitzer Prize for <laughs> for what he exposed. But what does he get? He gets a jail cell. He ought to be released. Uh, and and it's it's a fundamental principle that whistleblowers have to be protected. And he was a whistleblower. He's also a journalist. The fact that there aren't more uh, journalists from, from the so-called mainstream defending him is really a market share question, right? Uh, and and I'm you know to me it's not even it's not even close. Assange should have never been jailed. He should have never been left to uh, uh, have to sequester himself in the embassy in in London. He shouldn't be in a cell right now in in uh, the UK, and he shouldn't be extradited to the United States. There shouldn't be more of a trial. But the people who led us into that war in Iraq. Jimmy, they need to be held accountable. Yeah, they need to be held accountable for the for the five thousand, uh, almost five thousand American men and women who lost their lives, the tens of thousands injured, the million Iraqis. You know, there were war crimes committed in the name of the American people. They lied to us, and that is who we should be focusing on for accountability. Not a guy who said, "Hey, do you know what? Um, they're they're killing people." Uh, in this situation uh, that is horrific. And why, why are we not saying something about that? I mean, if, you know, so yeah, Assange ought to be free. No question about it. Um, okay. Well, I, I, we really wish you the best of luck in your campaign. Uh, I'm a big De Dennis Kucinich supporter. And um, I was born in Euclid where he's from. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Euclid, Ohio. Oh, look at hey. that. <laughs> so, um, what, what is that? The Euclid Panthers? What's their? Oh, what, I don't know. I moved when I was young. I went to Thomas Jefferson Elementary in Euclid. Well, and we well, moved. listen. Uh, uh, we're going to do what we can to take care of Northern Ohio. But Euclid's not in my district, but I'm very familiar with it. <laughs> hey, Russ has one more question about uh, in, in, insider trading. Go ahead, Russ. All right. So Nancy Pelosi every single year outperforms the world's greatest money managers. And and to be fair, it's not just her. Both sides of the aisle. Well, she just, What's the she just happens to do it better than anybody else. He's better than her. Isn't this blatant insider trading? And shouldn't these people go to prison? And if you were in Congress, would you introduce uh, proposals for the SEC to investigate Nancy Pelosi and other members of Congress who are clearly, clearly profiting from insider trading? Yeah, I, I, you know, look, um, first of all, I'm not going to come away from this interview and say that I want to put Nancy Pelosi in jail. <laughs> <laughs> that is not going to well, happen. Well, why not? You we know, can't even bless not? people for torture. Look, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, should we, address, should we address the insider trading? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, members of Congress should not be 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 trading these portfolios that people have uh you know at, at the at the best they should be put in in trust and they you know and sometimes people will say they've done that but you know with with members of congress it, you know unfortunately for the senate and for some members of the house you know mostly people are multi-millionaires decamillionaires and beyond uh sometimes not always but sometimes you when you get a distance from a certain income group, you forget about the mass of American people just trying to make ends meet. Well, you know, I can just tell you that I uh, w would I be working on those kind of reforms that you suggest? Yes. Uh, am I about putting people in jail? Nah, but am I about stopping the practice? Absolutely. But do doesn't it hurt any kind of faith people have in government when people say, no, no, no. Nancy shouldn't go to jail. I would go to jail if I were yeah, outperforming yeah, well, well, Warren Buffett and Martha Bill Stewart Ackman. Had to go to jail I'd go to time. jail. She went to jail. <laughs> Kurt would go to jail. So yeah, why doesn't yeah, well, Nancy go to jail? Well, you know what? Um, I, I'm telling you again that I'm, you know, remember, I go in as an independent. I want to be in a position where I can bring people together. It would be kind of difficult to do that. If one of the lead, if I want to put in jail one of the leaders of the Democratic Party, not going to do it. It would I'm make you very to... popular, though. What are you going to try war crimes too? You maniac! <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Check, please. <laughs> hey, before I let you go, I just want to ask you about your stint with the RFK Jr. Yeah. And, you know, we think he, uh, a lot of people have, uh, uh, you know, attracted to his free speech stance like you have, anti-censorship, his ability to stand up against corporations uh, as an environmental lawyer. And he stood up against Big Pharma. And uh, he's the only voice that a lot of people have about COVID. Uh, and then he comp- and he was he got it right on Ukraine, which was amazing. And then he totally throws it all out the window when it comes to uh, Gaza and Il- uh, and uh, Israel. And uh, he even went even further and uh, kind of saber rattled with Iran and Venezuela and China and Russia uh, over oil. Uh, so. Tell me about uh, how, uh, if, if if you want to talk about it, I would appreciate it if you share with our audience what that was like, because uh, I know you're a staunch supporter of the Palestinians and you want peace, and uh, you've always been for peace. So tell me what what was it like to 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 be his campaign manager and how did you guys split? Well, I, Bobby and I have known each other thirty years. He actually flew to Cleveland. Uh, prior to the campaign, met with myself and my wife, Elizabeth, and we talked about the campaign. And when he told me that he was going to run at, you know, as a Democrat, uh, I told him, look, uh, what can I do to help? And he immediately asked me, uh, would you run my campaign? I said, sure. Bobby and I uh, are friends. Uh, uh, and as the campaign evolved, you know, without getting into areas that cross into a violation of a do not disclosure uh, agreement that is a contract that I had, I will say this, that, uh, you know, there were disagreements uh, that occurred. And and I felt uh, that I was at a crossroads where I had to make some decisions about whether the campaign was totally consistent with the direction that I wanted the state going, or maybe it was time for me to go in another direction. So I chose to go in another direction. Uh, I love Bobby Kennedy. He's a good he's a good man, and I wish him well. Uh, I have my own campaign now, and believe me, that's what I'm focusing on. Okay, all right, everybody. Uh, where can people go? They want to support you. Kucinich.com. There it is, right over yeah, your Kucinich, shoulder. Kucinich.com, uh, and it would be you know you can you can help by contributing. You can help uh, if you want to come come to uh, Northern Ohio and help us canvas. We're going to be covering the doors of voters in four counties. Uh, I'm, um, uh, you know, you might help on research. I mean, any way that you think you might be able to help, go to Kucinich.com, send us a message, let me know. Uh, this, in, in many ways, this is really about securing uh, America's uh, position for its own people. And uh, that's kind of what I'm about. That's what this campaign's about. Jimmy, it means a lot to be on your show and to have this discussion. Uh, it, it, it's about getting real. It's about looking at things as they are and 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 coming up with uh, an approach that can address the practical aspirations of the American people. And those practical aspirations, I can guarantee you, do not include endless war. They're about jobs and wages and, and health care and housing and retirement security and good neighborhoods, crime, you know, addressing the crime issues that are afflicting a lot of uh, neighborhoods. We, we, we need to recover our country, and I'm ready to do that. So thank you so much for being on your show. Okay, you, uh, uh, thank you for coming on. Everybody, uh, check out Kucinich.com. He's running as an independent in Ohio's 7th House District. We wish you all the luck. We'll talk to you again soon, hopefully. Thanks again, Jimmy. I appreciate it very much. Hey, come see us do a live stand-up show. We'll be in Bend, Oregon, Portland, Seattle, Philadelphia. Avenal, New Jersey, Boston, Palm Springs, Ta- Stockholm, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Berlin, and London. We're adding a second show in London. The first show sold out. See you there. Mm-hmm.